Welcome, and thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. We want you to fully engage with us, so feel free to gather your family, invite a friend, or if you're alone, we trust that you'll have a wonderful worship experience with us today. Our worship service will begin in just a few minutes.
in our lives, God, in our world, God. We just thank you so much. Move, Father. Move in our hearts, God.
this moment um, we'd like to spend a few moments just uh, reflecting and asking God uh, how we can give back towards the kingdom work there are five ways to give which are up on the screen and for those of you who have been here before you know we don't necessarily go up and we don't go up and down the aisles collecting the offering but we just ask you to spend that time with God and have him reveal to you how you should give I'd also like to pray for over our prayer walls so if we could all just bow our heads and close our eyes Heavenly Father thank you for Thank you for moving in our lives. Thank you for being the miracle worker that you are. God, I pray that you just be with your people, Lord. Touch their hearts, Lord. Give us generous hearts, Father. Lord, I pray that we we give back because at the end of the day, you're the owner of everything. Lord, I pray that you use whatever is given, Father, in a mighty, mighty way. Multiply it abundantly, Lord, well beyond anything that we could imagine, Father. Lord, I pray for wisdom over those who are managing the funds, Father, that they use it in an appropriate manner so that they can bring glory to you as well. Heavenly Father, I want to pray over our prayer walls, Lord, those petitions that are on there. And I just want to thank you, Lord, for all the ways that we can come to you in our brokenness and how you hear us, Father. All we have to do is ask. I pray for supernatural healing, Lord, where it's required. I pray, Father, for healing of relationships, Lord, where they're broken. And I just again ask you, Father, to move mightily as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for uh, the privilege to uh, hear from you, the privilege of even having the text to learn from, to grow from. And God, I pray that you would now help me, help your people. I pray that you would just remove all the hindrances and uh, barriers that I may have in my own heart that I may be able to hear from you clearly to be able to speak to your people clearly. Remove the same from uh, your people's hearts and those who are listening. And God, that those who are listening do not know you, I pray that at the end of the day that they will come to know you as well. So Lord, we love you. We thank you for the privilege as also, also to gather uh, in a place called a uh, worship uh, um, service and a, and a building that we call the church. But Lord, we know ultimately we the people are the church. So God, move in our hearts that we may clearly represent you in everything that we think, say, and do. In the magnificent name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing in a series I've entitled for you, Please Move God. Please Please, please, maybe we should say please, 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 please move God. Now, we've been also learning that God is always noticeably moving in our lives in some unique way. Uh, remember, we looked at Joshua chapter 24, which says, verses 13 and 14, it says, I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities which you had not built and you have lived in them, you are eating of vineyards and olive groves, which you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. So just like God speaking to the children of Israel when they were inheriting the promised land, they had nothing to do with it. And similarly, there's so many things that God, are, God is doing in our lives that we have nothing to do with it. We're just waking up every morning living life, and by God's grace, he is so, so much blessing us and moving in our lives in, in some unique and special ways. Make sense? And as I mentioned before, listen, even the move of God to continue to breathe life into you so you can wake up to you can enjoy the things that he has so graciously given you and I, uh, we can't negate that and just skip over that and say, God, give me more because he's already given us enough. Especially if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the ultimate gift of God is what? Eternal life that's found in Christ and Christ alone. So if he says, that's enough, Cedric, I should be completely satisfied with his move in my life. But yet, we can't not exclude that God does want to do some special things in each one of our lives. Right? It could be in relationships. It could be that you're in a broken relationship with a son or a daughter. Maybe your marriage is falling apart. Maybe your finances is in disarray. Maybe you're trying to figure your career path out or whatever it may be. There, there's this, this extra move of God, this extra measure of grace that we need God to just, I need you to show up now. And he desires to do that. And as I mentioned to you before, in the book of Isaiah, if you read it in its proper context, it is said about the first 39 chapters of Isaiah had to do with the children of Israel dealing with themselves. Very rebellious, stiff-necked, hard-hearted people. Matter of fact, he said to them, you are adulterers. You have committed adultery towards me. You're acting like a harlot, he says to them. But then it gets to chapter 65, verse 24, and the prophet Isaiah says this to the people. It would also come to pass that before they, meaning you call, the people call, I, meaning God, would answer. So think about that. Before you even call on me, I want to answer you. Amen. Can you imagine that? Being so much a part of your personal relationship with the Holy God, that before you even call on him, he's about to answer you. Because he knows your thoughts before you think them. He knows what's deeply seated in all of our hearts. So he can if he desires. And matter of fact, I'm sure you, like I, have had scenarios that he did answer and I didn't even ask him. 
The text goes on to say in verse 24, Isaiah 65, I will answer you, right? It says, while they, meaning you, are still speaking, I, God, will listen. So as you're, you're speaking and before you speak, right, because he knows our thoughts before we even say anything, right, he wants to listen. It's not a God that's far off. He's intimately listening but the reality is, in so many of our lives, we're just not ready for this move of God. Uh, right? I'm not really ready for my wife to respect me. Because I haven't really loved her as Christ loved the church and gave his very life for her. Not ready for my husband to love me. Not ready for my parents to respect me like they require me to respect them, right? We can look at every place and every relational aspect in our lives, and, and a lot of it is hinged upon, am I really ready for what God wants to do, right? It's kind of like your, your children, our children, they'll grow up and say, I want to drive, but they're 12 years old. It's like, you're not ready yet. Right? Or they may be 21 years old. <laughs> and you still may say, you probably still ain't ready. Depending on the person, right? And similarly, that's why you see so many times, so many times you even see a sinner receive what you're asking God for. Because God even reigns on the unjust. And he will give it to them before he give it even to his children because he knows how they will manage it. And some in weird way bring him glory. But yet we will hoard it, keep it for ourselves. And he knows that. So I have to move a little slower in that area in your life. I have to move a little slower in your marriage. You know why? Because truth be told, you've already made your husband your God. Because he's become your priority. Matter of fact, you move quicker when he says move than you move when God says move. You see how it can... The very thing that God wants to do could be because of me, not because he's incapable, not because he doesn't want to, but could it be me, just not ready? And that's why we started off this, this journey really uh, underscoring that God, I want you to move, but you must first move in me. You must first do some transformational work in my heart, right? Remember we talked about last week that there's this responsibility of God. Give me the courage to allow you to deal with the sin in me, right? Remove the planks from my eyes so I can clearly see. What's the source and cause of conflicts among you? Isn't it that there's some issues going on with me? I ask with wrong motives, right? I, I, I want to spend it on me, right? And, and, and all these things really that have, that doesn't have to do with anything to do with anyone but me. Could it be, look, strangely enough, that you're just believing God for a supernatural move on your job so that you may get that promotion, but you never get it it's because potentially you're not ready for it. Could it be when you get it that you would abuse the power that's given to you? Could it be that uh, you start now prioritizing that job and that career over your prioritization of the cross of Christ? Could be, could not be, only God and you know that. Follow me? And that's that journey, remember we talked about last week, that's the journey you, all of us have to go on is that discovery of God, is it really me? If it is me, deal with me. Just let me be real. That God, I have a problem with managing money. 
because the money has been managing me historically. And just lay it out before God and say, it's my fault. And watch what see any, what any good father would do when any child comes to realization that they're wrong. Moving me. Today we're going to focus on God move through me. Move through me. God, I will allow you to mold me so you can use me. So God, my heart now is clean before you. I've, I've discovered and uncovered all these different things in me that I've now came, I've come clean with and said, God, you, you know exactly what I'm dealing with. But now it's time for you to, to start moving and molding and developing me so you can now use me however you choose to use me in whatever capacity, whatever area you want me to be used. So if you can now open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11 uh, defines our first area, which is God, I'll let you mold me with your wisdom. So mold me with your wisdom, not my wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, not the wisdom of my mother or my father, not the wisdom of my grandparents, not the wisdom of some whomever that you are depending on, but mold me with your wisdom. Listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2 verses 6 through 13 says. Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages of our of, of, ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eyes has not seen, ears have not heard, and which have not entered the human heart that God has prepared for those who love him. Sounds like our lives, doesn't it? God, what have you prepared for me? Because I love you. Now, if you take that out, you know, if you don't love him, well, there's some other things you prepared, but, <laughs> but right, so, but, but man, I, God, I love you. What are you preparing for me that eyes have not seen or ears have heard and are entered to the thoughts of man that you have for me? Verse 10, for to us, God revealed them through the spirit for the spirit searches all things, even the depths of God for who among people knows the thoughts of a person except the spirit of the person, meaning that's in them, right? So the only one who really knows you is you. So also the thoughts of God, no one knows except whom? God or the Spirit of God. So if I want to know God, I must know his Spirit. And his Spirit is only accessible and available to those who have what? Put their faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So no relationship with Christ, God through Christ, no Holy Spirit who lives within you. Therefore, you have no knowledge of of God and what God wants of you. Or you could say it this way. If I put my faith and trust in the spirit of God and in, in, in the finished work of God through Christ and his spirit lives within me, but yet I still don't know God. Could it be that I am not listening and obeying and being led by the spirit of God who lives within me, who gives me the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, the heart of God, the mind of God. See the connection. Now, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Verse 13, 
We also speak things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. God molded me through the power of your Holy Spirit with your wisdom. I got to stop thinking like I think. I just got to stop responding how I respond, moving how I normally move, operating how I normally operate based upon human wisdom. If I really want you to move in my life. God is not going to move through fleshly tendencies. He's not. God wants to mold us with life skills, wisdom. Look at verse 6 again. A wisdom, however, not of this age. Wisdom is here, part of the definition of the word wisdom is skill, tact, expertise in any art, skill in the affairs of life. So if, if you today need to navigate life in a way that it is ultimately for his glory, but for whatever reason, when we glorify him, sometimes it just turns out for our good, good, bad, or indifferent. Even the bad becomes good when it's for his glory. If I need that GPS, if you would, for my life, it comes through whom? A wisdom, however, that is not of this age. God will give you and I life skills based upon his wisdom to know how to skillfully and tactfully, with great expertise, manage the affairs of life. That's what he promises. But then also, God wants to mold us with wisdom that is not of this world. Listen to verse 6 again. A wisdom, however, that is not of this age. The word age means this, not of this period of time. So think about that. We're in a very precarious time. God's wisdom is not of this time because it's timeless, because he's a timeless God. So many times we make decisions based upon times. You follow me? Well, you know, just like last time. Well, you know, in the 60s. Well, you know, in the 70s. Well, you know, now, in the, you know, it, it's 2023. Well, you know, I can't believe it. We've never seen a time like this. God is not constrained by time. His wisdom is not constrained by time. So not of this age, not of this time period. It is a perpetuity of time, not of this universe. That's the wisdom God promises us. But we must allow this wisdom to take hold of us. God wants to mold us with life skills God wants to mold us with wisdom, not of this world. And this word wisdom goes on to be defined this way. The simplicity of the gospel. The, do you realize the gospel fits every narrative? It fits every cultural perspective. Racial perspective geographical perspective, the gospel is the only thing that is able to cross-pollinate. Language cross-pollinates it all. This wisdom, also where wisdom goes on to be, further be def defined as supreme intelligence such as belonging to only God. Who in their right mind wouldn't want supreme intelligence? But it only comes from 
God, mold me with your supernatural wisdom. God wants to mold us with wisdom that is from the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 10 and 13. For us, God revealed them through who? The Spirit. Verse 13. Those taught by whom? The Holy Spirit combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Two important words to define here. The the word revealed in verse 10 means this. To lay open what has been veiled or covered up. So God through his Holy Spirit, through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, has now laid open what has been veiled or covered up so it's accessible to you and I. Last word, verse 13, is the word taught. It means things or lessons taught or imparted or suggested by the Holy Spirit as contrasted to the things taught by words of human wisdom. God's wisdom will always be contrast to the wisdom of this world. Or you could say it this way. God's wisdom many times may not make sense. And that's why I think it's such a battle with us. Because we're encased in this flesh. We live in this world. We have accumulative wisdom over time. So for God to somehow interject his opinion, his wisdom, it causes tension because it's like, wait a minute. No, no, no. I've been doing it this way for so long. Matter of fact, my parents and my grandparents and their parents told me this, right? And so it has to be right. And why am I having this this contradictory opinion from the Holy Spirit? Just the way it is. It's kind of like this. Have you heard of the story of the lady with the ham? All right, let me tell you a story if you haven't heard it. All right, so this, this, this lady uh, gets married, and now she's preparing her first uh, Christmas ham, right? And she cuts off the ends of the ham, puts it in a pot, and the husband questions, why are you cut, cutting off the ends of the ham? It's, that's the best part of the meat. Why are you cutting it off? And she said, well, you know, that's the way I saw my, my mother and my grandmother make their ham. And then she calls her mom, hey, mom. You know, why do you cut the ends of the ham off? He says, I don't know. I just saw your grandmother cut the ends of the ham off. And that's the way I normally do, cut the you know, ends of the ham off. So then she called her mom, the grandma, and said, well, mom, why do you cut the ends of the ham? He said, well, the reason why I cut the ends of the ham off is because I never had a pot big enough for it to fit in. <laughs> it's, And that's how many times we operate. We don't even know why we do what we do. We just do it because somebody else told us what to do it, right? And listen, church, that happens even in churches because we're like a family. Well, well, do you realize that's not what the text really says? Well, you know, that's what my pastor said in the other church. Well, that's what I was taught in Bible study. And you just inherit these inappropriate nuggets of wisdom. But the Spirit of God, who knows the mind of God, wants to give us wisdom that will be contrast with everything we've accumulated over the years, but we have to allow him to mold us and trust his opinion, trust his voice, trust what he's doing in our hearts. You see, the spirit of, if the Spirit of Christ dwells in you, He becomes your wisdom. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says this, But it is due to Him that you are in Christ, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So this wisdom that I'm referring to, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you just don't have it, and you won't have it, until you first surrender your life to him. But if you have surrendered your life to him and he lives within you and you're not walking in this wisdom, it's not because it's not available to you. It's because you're not allowing it to re-adapt you on how to live life in a way that is honoring to him and helpful to you. 
you got to let them mold you. Amen? Mold me with your wisdom. But then look at Isaiah chapter 30 real quickly. Isaiah 30 verses 18 through 22. We're going to say it this way. Mold me with, uh, with uh, excuse me, mold me as your teacher or as my teacher. Mold me as my teacher. Isaiah 30 verses 18 through 22. It says, therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. You hear that? He longs to be gracious to you. And therefore, he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. He longs for us. We have to do what? Reciprocate by doing what? Longing for him. Verse 19. For you people in Zion inhabited in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will certainly be gracious to you at the sound of your cry when he hears it. He will answer you. Although the Lord has given you bread of deprivation and water of oppression, in other words, you had to go through a season, right? He, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will see your teacher. Your ears will hear a word behind you. Listen to what this is said. This is so wonderful. Saying, this is the way. Walk in it whenever you turn to the right and to the left. And you would desecrate your carved images plated with silver and your cast metal images plated with gold. You would scatter them as filthy things and say to them, be gone. This is the way. Walk in it. This is the wonderful privilege God gives you and I. It's to have his voice in your ear saying, this is the way. And if you don't have that, it's two things. You don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. One. Two. Maybe three. You're not nurturing your relationship with Jesus Christ. Three, you don't trust them. You're just like, you're going to just do whatever you want to do. Our teacher wants to direct us. He, your teacher, the word teacher means to point, to shoot with an arrow. He wants to point you and he wants to shoot you like an arrow exactly where you should be. Now, no one just arbitrarily shoots an arrow, they want to, they shoot the, the arrow to do what? Hit the target. So he's not just shooting you arbitrarily. He's shooting you in a direction so you can hit the bullseye. That's, his, that's what he wants. Listen to the impact of the teacher's curriculum. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17 says this. All scripture... This is the teacher's curriculum. All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? Verse 17. So that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. Every good work. Good work that is honoring him. And drawing others to him. Every good work. If today that you're trying to honor him on your job, let the teacher teach you from his word. And he'll shoot you in the right direction every time. Like arrows hitting a bullseye. Everything that you need in life If it's for the good work, the word of God will be and should be your guide. It's your curriculum as a student. It has to be what you lean upon and rely upon more than any other text known to man. Has to be. And if you're not weighing what you're doing in your business and in your for your future and your career and your marriage and your life and your family, if you're not weighing it against the text, you have to then question what kind of work are you up to? It 
Is it good or not? Yet our teacher doesn't want to be rejected. You see, because he says he would no longer hide himself. Well, does God ever hide himself? No. We hide from him. When Adam and Eve sinned, did God hide from them? No, he pursued them. That's why he sent Jesus. He's ever pursuing us. He's ever pursuing this church. So it's, it's, it's not like, so when you hear this, it's almost like he's saying this rhetorically. He's like, no, I'm never hiding from you. You hiding from me. Why would he say to you and I, I'm your teacher, but then hide from you? It's never that way. The word hide means this, therefore. It says to be hidden from view, to be put in a corner, to be thrusted aside. That doesn't sound anything like the person who is hidden being what? God's not going to just put himself in a corner. He's not going to thrust, thrust himself aside. You follow me? That's why it's important to understand the definition of this word because it transfers the ownership and say, oh, the reason why he's hidden from view is because I have relocated. And many of us know what we're talking about there, right? Is that we don't hear from God. We don't, we don't see God move. It's because we have relocated, not him. We've relocated with our attitudes, right? Why are you grumbling and complaining? Why are you not content with what I've already given you, right? And, uh, uh, well, well, it's God hasn't moved. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's because we have hidden ourselves from his view. We have put him in a corner. We have thrusted him aside. Verse 21 says this, your ears, remember, were here a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. This is what he wants to do. Mow me as my teacher. God, teach me by directing me, and God, help me not reject your teaching anymore. Let me not reject your voice anymore. And then he is our teacher. Our teacher wants to be seen. So he doesn't want to be rejected, but he wants to be visible in our lives. He wants to be invited in our lives. In every situation, in every decision, he wants to be front and center. Acknowledge him in what? In all of your ways. Then he'll make it what? Straight. Not just some, but all. Right? So if my path isn't straight, right? It, it's, it's sometimes very important to kind of, I like to say, do the backside of the verse. Acknowledge him in all your ways and you what? Make your pathway straight. My pathways aren't straight. Therefore, have I acknowledged him in all my ways? And if I haven't, or if they're not straight, I must go on that personal discovery and say, God, uh, where am I thrusting you aside in? What have I taken you out of the equation? He wants to be seen. The word see in verse 20 means this, to see physically outside of oneself. So think about that. It is to, to see outside of myself, right? Not what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, what I perceive, what I know personally, but I need to see him outside of myself. I need to see him outside of my pain. I need to see him outside of my perspective, out of my traditions. To see him outside of this, out of my normacies. I got to see him outside of my normacies. Because many times, show me anywhere in the Bible that God did something normal. Because he would never be placed in a box. To see physically outside of oneself. Listen, it goes on to say, to see so that one can learn and know. 
It's a spiritual observation and comprehension by means of seeing visions. And yes, God does speak to us and show us visions and dreams. Or you could say he allows us to see the unseen. Moses had a longing to know and to see and to follow God. And listen to what uh, Moses says in Exodus chapter 33, verses 13 through 16. He says, if I found favor in your sight in any way, please let me know your way so that I may know you. Let me know your ways that I may know you. Listen, let me not just know your way so I can get some from you. What kind of relationship was that? I want to know you because I just want to know you. And in, in the beautiful part of any relationship is that everything about that person comes along with it. And in my humble opinion, that is probably one of the biggest struggles in the church today is that I want to know you, but God, I want to know partially you. I don't want to know the hard things. I don't want to know your wrath. I don't want to know your discipline. Just, just give me that part that somehow just benefits me. All right, it's kind of like when you date that wonderful, beautiful woman, you get married, then you start knowing all of her. <laughs> Right? It's like, oh, it sucks that I made a, make a mistake. No, you didn't. You, now you just know her. Amen. Completely. But what you going to do with that? Now that you know. Now that you know her fears that wig you out. That maybe it's not your fears, but it's her fears. Now you know her emotions. That maybe you're not emotionally you know, attached to, but yet, you follow me? It's, it, everything comes along with it. Everything comes along with our relationship with God. But here's the cool thing. He is all good. God is all good. So our responsibility is to be okay with knowing him in his fullness because knowing him in his fullness, even those things that I just can't wrap my head and heart around, he's still good. He's still good. So when Moses says, again, please let me know your ways so that I may know you. I want to know your ways because I want to get to know you better. So he goes on to say, in order that I may find favor in your sight, consider too that this nation is your people. And he, meaning God, said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Verse 15 says, then he, Moses, said to him, God, if your presence does not go with us, don't lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we and I and your people may be distinguished from all other people who are on the face of the earth? Is it not by your going with us so that we and I, your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are on the face of the earth? Wouldn't it be amazing that we added that part in our prayers? Is that God, can you move in my life so that I may be distinguished from all the other people who are on the face of this earth? Now, remember, when that happens, it still comes back to him. It, it, right? Because, oh, you're different. Well, why are you so different? It's because of him. Because I didn't dig my own well. I didn't build my own house. You follow me? I didn't do any of this by myself. So who could take the credit? Only God. You follow me? So it's just this wonderful circle. So our teacher desires to direct us. But we can't reject him. We must allow him to just do whatever he needs to do on the inside of us so that we can see him fully. Here's lastly. Listen. After we're molded, after we're taught by the wonderful teacher, then he can start using us ultimately to reconcile the world. So I want us to, to really understand this, is that when God moves 
for, uh, through us and for us is ultimately for one goal only. So that he may be known in all the world. The ultimate goal. Do you realize that even our troubles in our lives are so that he may be known? You could be going through a season right now, nothing's going right. You know why? He wants to be glorified. Trust him. Trust him. But then on the other side, if, if you want God to move in some extraordinary way, you have to ask yourself why. Is it merely so I can have a more comfortable life? Have a life that I am pleased my dreams are coming to pass. My goals are being accomplished. It really, it's not good enough in the eyes of a holy God. It's really shallow. It's very shallow to only be thinking that I want God to move so I can get something from God. Now, again, the beauty of the relationship with God is he does give us good things that comes along with it, but that cannot be our motive, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. But we can't say, God, give me things, give me these things, give me these things, and let me, let's bypass your righteousness and bypass your kingdom. Just doesn't work that way. And remember, that's in every area of your life. Every area. Your children could be rebellion, rebelling. And if your prayers are simply, God, can you just stop them from rebelling? Because I just want to have a good night of sleep. It just doesn't work that way. God, can you fix this? Because at the end of the day, I want you to be glorified. God, I don't know how it's going to happen. I'm not even going to waste my time to figure out how it's going to happen. But somehow you just be glorified in it. And then go to sleep. And let God be God. And you know what that does as well? It'll preserve your relationship with your children. Because they'll see that you, you aren't wigging out. And you ain't trying to be controlling. And you're not trying to manipulate. Because that's what normally happens. You try to manipulate them, coerce them. Well, okay, I, you know, if you do this, I'll give you this. Well, you know, I help you with this. I help you with that. And then we start all trying to maneuver and be God versus just, hey, God, you be glorified. Apparently, you're in full control. You know exactly what my child needs. You know exactly what they need. You are their answer. I know you're their answer. I can't force them to, to accept you as the answer. But you know what, God? I'm just going to lay it at your feet and say to you right now, God, You'll be glorified in their life in whatever unique way you want to be glorified. And go to sleep. In that moment, what we've done is given God permission to be God. Because at the end of the day, our end game must be, God, you're doing this in me, so you do something through me. First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 20 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them. 
He has committed to us the word order, a word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God, use me. Use me in my gospel service. There's a gospel service that every person in this room has, young or old. There's a service that you are called and created to do. Once you give your life to Jesus, you are called and created for service. Unique to you. Verse 18 gives us a word, ministry. It means it's service towards a master or guest. Those by the command of God, proclaim and promote the gospel. In other words, there's a service that you're called to that promotes the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he's molding you for. That's what he's preparing you for. It's just not my job to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's your job. It's our job. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 8 reminds us that our ministries are different but are from from the same source and for the same purpose. Listen to what it says. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties uh, of, which means distinct and different ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties, again, distinction and differences of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons, but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. That's you and that's me. For the record, even though I'm the lead pastor of Commitment Church, I am only but a part of the body. I'm not the head. Amen. For the record, Jesus is the head of the church, yes. period. Amen. I am only a part of the body doing my function just like you should do your function. We get it twisted sometimes. I am not the head of the church, nor any leader on the face of this planet, planet is not the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. Yeah. We're only functioning parts for the common good. Make sense? Yeah. So it's our responsibility to say, God, use me in whatever service that you have for me that will edify you and will be for the common good. Lastly, use me to speak to the world. Those who do not know you, Jesus, use me to speak to the world. And if you're not speaking to the world, you're not being used by God. And if you're not being used by God, chances are you have not allowed him to teach you and you're not allowing him to mold you. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. You just back it up, backtrack it. If you are not allowing him to speak through you as an oracle of a man, woman, child, young, old, wherever you are, in between, listen, educated or not educated, rich or poor, male or female, the bottom line is you and I have a responsibility to allow the Spirit of God to speak through us to a dying world. It's our job. It's our calling. That's why we're created. Yes. Listen to what it says. God was in Christ, reconciling the world uh, uh, to himself. It says, as though God were making an appeal through us. God wants to appeal to the world through you. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This word reconcile means this. It, it's, it's defined ultimately as this appeal of reconciling mankind back to God in a pre-edemic false state. In other words, that God and man can walk in a garden together again. That's the relationship we have through Christ, that we have fellowship with God again. That's what we owe to a dying world. This word appeal is a Greek word parakaleo, which means to call to one side, to speak to, entreaty, to exhort, to entreat or beg. So he is calling us to his side or we're, he's to our side, right? Entreating and begging and pleading 
that people come to know him and be reconciled. It's our job. Romans 10, 13 through 15 went in with this and we prayed these verses during prayer a couple of weeks back. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him who have they not heard? They don't believe because they haven't heard. And how are they to hear without a preacher? But how are they to preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. It's our job. All of you are preachers. All of you are preachers. All of you are preachers. It is your job to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ. You know? Listen, I, I, I'm a formal career pe- preacher, but guess what? You're a career preacher as well. It's your job to go take the good news of Jesus Christ to every man, woman, child of all nations and tribes and tongues in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. It's your job. Can you imagine if it was just my job? It wouldn't go anywhere. How limited it will be if it's only me. It's everybody's job, church. In whatever creative way that he's assigned to you, that's your job to go be with Jesus and figure it out. God, what is my unique way of telling the world about Jesus? Here at our church, yeah, we're going to give you opportunities, Ewoks, right? That's opportunities. You can just go and walk and pray and, and, and step back and observe, but you can walk and pray. Or if you can't walk, stay and pray. Phys- well, I can't physically. Okay, that's all right. Well, stay and pray. Well, but you understand, I have kids. You know, well, bring the kids with you. <laughs> go on a family stroll. It, there's no excuse. Yesterday, we had medical students here in our church from all nations, tribes, and tongues here twice a month commit to be here and just love on them. If you need any water, can make you coffee. Can I show you what a restroom is? How can we pray for you? Can you imagine all the dozens of people that show up for medical service, that you can come and just hang out and just, hey, how you doing? I'm so-and-so from Commitment. Thank you so much for coming by our medical clinic. How can we help you? I was talking to one of the physicians on yesterday, and he reminded me I met him years ago, and this is our first time seeing each other again. And I said, hey, I was talking to him and one of the other physicians. I said, just please know that we hear from you. We hear for you. We're here for the spiritual part. I said, because you guys are going through this, you're going through this. And he's like, yeah, you know, you're right. Thanks for reminding me kind of thing. We got people playing cricket with people who are from India. Go play cricket. We need help with our Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts in this area. Because Pastor Mike and and Marissa, guess what? They can't be here every day. So we need people to say, you know, I'll be here. I'll be the host for the Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. I'll let them in the building. But I'll be there faithfully. You follow me? Well, you know, God, I'll be here to serve in our youth ministry, you know, because because I want to help 
other young women come to know Jesus Christ like I have come to know Jesus. I want to help other young men. You know, I want to serve our men. I want to be a part of men's ministry because I know wherever the men go, so goes any church, so goes any family. So come me in. I'll be there. I'll serve because I'll grow. I'll do whatever it takes to help other men become more like Jesus. It's that easy. You don't have to stand up here like here, like, like I do. You don't have to do that. Well, you know what? I'll commit to be all in to come every single Sunday, 30 minutes ahead of time, and be on my knees to pray and intercede that God will break strongholds and he will send people from the north, south, east, and west of all nations, tribes, and tongues. I'll be here and I'll commit and that'll be my ministry. Can you imagine what will happen on a Sunday morning? Find your ministry. Yeah, there's others who will, are called to be teachers and preachers, and all that stuff will happen naturally. But start somewhere. You gotta start somewhere. Start somewhere. There's a lady who was a poet back in the 1800s, and she secretly married her husband because her father disapproved. So after being wedded, the, the Browning family sailed to Italy, and they said that they lived there for the rest of their lives. But even in uh, the, her parents dis, while her parents disowned her, she committed to writing them every single week. About 10 years passed. Um, never got a reply. But one day, a big box showed up. She opens it up, and it's all the letters that she ever wrote in 10 years, unopened. It said that, you know, if her parents would have chose to at least open up a few of those letters, could their relationship been reconciled? You see, church, you know what? We're the letters. And if you never let God break your seal, there'll be people who never get to know him. There will be people that will never be reconciled back to him because you are the letters. And if no one is able to read your life and see the transformation that has gone on in your life, there will be people in your life and around you in this community, in this world, that would never come to know him until your letter is opened. Will you let him open your letter? Let's pray. Father, you're faithful. Because as even the Apostle Paul says that we are living epistles that you have written, Jesus, on our hearts. But God, how can others get to know you, Jesus, without them reading what you have written on our hearts? Thank you for joining us here at Commitment Online, a place for all nations. If you're ever in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey region, we hope to see you in person. But for now, please tune in next week here at Commitment Online.